All right, my friends. Well, I am glad to be back with you again today. Um, let's open our time with a word of prayer. Holy One, I thank you for uh, the fact that you promise always that you're with us, that there is no place that we can go where we would be absent from your presence, God. And I, I pray today in a special way for everyone who's listening that you would open their eyes to a greater awareness of the fact that you're right there with them, that you're nearer to us, God, even than our breath that there is no point at which we are gone from your presence. And so may that be a comfort to us, your people, particularly as we face continually still difficult times, um, stressful situations, the beginning of a new school year for those who have children. There's so many things going on, Lord, that we need your help, we need your presence, and we need to be refreshed by you because you are the source of our life. So today, God, I pray that you would do that in our hearts and our minds. I pray that you would be glorified today as we open your word. And I pray, God, that, that you would open our eyes, that we might understand it more fully, so that we might love you in a deeper way. Uh, and as, as we love you, God, that you would cause us also to learn how to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we pray this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, so last week we completed chapter 9, and I introduced chapter 10 where we witness an angelic figure there um, who I began to describe. So let's, let's read that section from chapter 10 again as we continue uh, through the rest of chapter 10 today. This is the first seven verses from Revelation chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head and his face like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded, and when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would we be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. The angel that John witnesses standing with his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the land looks in many ways like Jesus, as I described last week. Each of their faces shine like the sun. Uh, either of them are described in Revelation as having feet or legs which look like fire on the one hand and burnished flaming bronze on the other. This angel has a rainbow surrounding his head, even as there is a rainbow which surrounds the throne of God in heaven, which we see in Revelation chapter 4 etc. There's many very obvious parallels. And so while there are many who would argue that this angel is in fact Jesus, I for one am not finally convinced. And that is in particular because of Revelation 1 verse 1 or the first verse of our book where John says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. Um, this is the first time where, we, uh, where the, the revelation which John is given shifts from being seeing alone, a visionary kind of experience, to where now he actually receives, receives revelation directly from the hand of an angel. And I believe that this is what John is referring to in Revelation 1.1. And so it is a revelation of Jesus Christ, but it is not given to him directly from the hand of Christ himself. Rather, Jesus sends an angel to John in order to deliver the revelation to him. And the more that I read and the more that I kind of focus in on some of Peter Lightheart's arguments, the more I am convinced that this is the spirit rather than an, a merely an angel alone. 
The Holy Spirit is rightly called an angel, though that may seem strange, but the word angel in Greek, well, and also include the word angel in Hebrew, simply means messenger. And it, it may refer to some sort of an angelic kind of being, a spiritual being, um, but it can also be used to describe human messengers. And in this way, the Spirit is certainly a messenger who is sent by Jesus into the world uh, and, and to the saints. The Spirit comes to proclaim what he hears and to deliver those things to the saints. As Jesus says in John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and will declare it to you. And I believe that this is what we actually are witnessing occurring here, that the Spirit is being sent to John precisely. He comes in the visage of Jesus as the messenger sent from Jesus, um, and he therefore delivers this revelation to John, as, uh, as John says, the angel being delivered, um, uh, the angel delivering the revelation to him, as he says in Revelation 1.1. In this passage, we see uh, that the angel uh, raises his right hand uh, and he swears an oath um, to the creator, the, the living one, the one who created the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything that is in it. And I think this is another reason to indicate that this is actually a divine figure um, rather than being merely an angel. Because God is one who ultimately swears oaths upon himself. We are commanded, on the contrary, not to swear oaths. Um, and I'm, now I can't think of the passage off the top of my head, but Jesus talks about not swearing upon anything in heaven because that is where God's throne is, not swearing by anything upon the earth because the earth is the Lord's footstool. Rather, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Um, this is in um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I believe it's Matthew chapter 5. Um, but you can look that up. God, however, frequently is shown swearing oaths to himself um, and this lifting of the right hand in order to swear upon God uh, calls us back to Ezekiel 20 verse 5 um, where we see that God himself is doing the very same thing. In Ezekiel 25, it says, Thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel, I swore. And the language there is literally when I raised my right hand. On the day when I chose Israel, I swore to the offspring of the house of Jacob, making myself known to them in the land of, of Egypt. I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. When God, God promises this oath, um, which he reminds them of in Ezekiel, raising his right hand, and it's a promise that he would be their God and he would take them out of the wicked land of Egypt. It is an oath of God, um, which ultimately brings God to uh, bring all of his promises to fruition. It causes the Passover. It causes um, all of the, the various plagues which God sends upon Egypt in order to remove his people from the wicked land. And now, too, people are being released from bondage in a new Egypt, which is Israel, if we, as we have discussed. And so I believe, again, that this oath also demonstrates that this is a divine figure and, in fact, the spirit of the living God. Likewise, we see that he stands upon the sea, and that's something which is also described in the Old Testament uh, in various places in Job, uh, in the Psalms. It describes God walking upon the sea, and of course, we know that Jesus himself also is one who walks upon the sea. There's an interesting feature here um, with this idea of his foot being planted upon the land and upon the sea, is that it was an Israelite custom that one of the ways that you 
uh, confirmed a transaction of property was that you would actually exchange your uh, sandal for the sandal of the individual who was making the exchange. The giving of the sandal by taking it off and exchanging it demonstrates that the property had actually changed hands. The, the sandal, of course, uh, makes sense if you're transferring land because you walk upon the land using your sandal. And so this is this way that you would exchange uh, property would be done in this manner. And if you want to look this up, you can look at Ruth chapter 4, and it describes that custom in a little bit of detail. Standing upon the land and upon the sea, the spirit angel demonstrates possession of it. His right foot planted in the Mediterranean and his left foot planted in Israel. I think this, that we see here themes of, of creation as well. The spirit who hovers over the waters in the beginning now stands upon the seas and the lands now as he oversees and promises that the delay is over, that the new creation is coming. The spirit that hovered over the waters of the first creation now hovers over the waters of this world and will bring about new creation, which is ushered in through the resurrection resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who Paul says is the first fruits of the new creation. His resurrection is the beginning of the new world emerging in the midst of the old. It is new wine that cannot be contained in old wineskins. It is new life in the midst of the land which is dead and among, among a people who lack faith. The old things um, are ultimately crumbling away, even as the new creation is coming in bit by bit. And you and I experience this already. And Jesus says in John 17, 3, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. We, we already have eternal life. It's already begun for us. Go, passing through death is a mere formality, passing from this life into the life to come. Uh, and, it, and we ultimately know that, that for those who are in Christ Jesus, there will never be one moment, never even one moment, where we are not indwelt and filled by the presence of God the Spirit, where God is never to leave us for any moment from the moment that we believed. And that's an incredible, incredible comfort. The Gentile seas also, again, are given priority. It is the right foot. And you see uh, in the scriptures that the right side is always given priority. I apologize to those of you who are left-handed. Um, but in, in the biblical picture, in the bib biblical images, the right side is always preference. And we see here that the Gentiles will come into the church like a flood, as he promised that they will. And faithful Jews as well are also going to be saved. But they will be saved either by escaping the city that has become like Egypt before its destruction, or through their own deaths as martyrs, who will then ascend into the presence of God into the heavens. Okay. Um, I want to finish reading out chapter 10, and then we'll discuss again this, uh, the, this issue of the mystery that is to be fulfilled. Um, all right. Uh, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go and take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages. All right. Um, now, there is a bit of an enigmatic phrasing here um, when the angel raises his hand and swears an oath to God um, regarding this time of delay, this mystery of God being fulfilled. Um, and what it says is, uh, what it's translated as more, most often is there would be no more delay. But the phrase translated that way actually says that there will be no more chronos, that there will be no more time. 
There are two words for tr time. There's chronos and then there's kairos, each with a slightly different nuance to them. And how are we to understand this? The, is, this is John indicating that time itself is gone? Um, that would seem a strange way of, of understanding it. But let's look quickly at the way that John uses the word chronos and elsewhere. It has been used twice before in Revelation, once in Revelation 2, verse 21, where Jesus says that the woman Jezebel, who had been tempting the church, if you remember, um, they'd, they'd been leading people astray, that, that for a time, for a chronos, she will be given that time to repent before she is judged. Likewise, in chapter 6, when you remember, I've mentioned this many times, when the fifth seal is broken and the martyrs cry out for vindication, um, they are told again that they must wait a short time, a short chronos, um, until God would vindicate them. And in the future, in, in Revelation 20, when we actually finally get to a section in Revelation that concerns our future, um, it says that Satan will be unbound so that he can deceive the nations again, which will cause some to fall away, um, that he will be released for a short time, for a short chronos. In every time that the word chronos is used, it is used to indicate a duration or a measure of time. It indicates a waiting period. Kairos, on the other hand, is used throughout Revelation to indicate a particular time, as in more like a decisive a event, um, as in Revelation 1-3, that the time is near, it's at hand. Um, as, as the seventh trumpet, the voice from heaven again erupts in praise, saying that the time of judgment of the heavens and the earth was finally at hand. Um, it's always indicating a decisive event which was coming, as opposed to chronos, which is indicating a duration of time. And so when we look at these two usages, a chronos, a duration of time, a measure of time, um, is ended by a kairos, a decisive event. Contextualizing this then within the mission and work of Jesus, we see Christ likewise and repeatedly telling the people that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. And we see, we will see rather in uh, the seventh trumpet that this is precisely what does occur. That when the seventh trumpet rings, um, the angels are going to cry out saying that the kingdoms of earth have become the kingdoms of our God. The time is at hand as Jesus announced. Now, I think we might of course say that Perhaps this time was wholly fulfilled already when Jesus cries out upon the cross, it is finished. And that would make some sense if it was finished. You would presume that it was all done. Um, however, we know as a matter of fact that there was more which was coming, which Jesus' death achieves. The saving death of Christ inaugurates the fulfillment of the redemption of the world. But we see that this comes in stages. Christ must die, but then, of course, he must also rise from the dead. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus' death is not salvific. If Jesus remained in the grave, as Paul says, then Christians are to be pitied more than all. Because for one, we're guilty of lying about what God has done, and therefore we're guilty of great sin. But on the other hand, if Jesus did not rise from the dead then he says, we are yet still dead in our sins and our trespasses and that there is therefore no hope for us. So Jesus must, of course, die, but he must also rise from the dead. He must rise, but then he must also ascend into the heavens so that he might receive from the Father a kingdom and a dominion, as he says that the Son of Man, you would see me from now on seated at the right hand of the Father and coming on the clouds, that his death and resurrection also results then in his exaltation because now he is worthy to be the one who receives the kingdom. But in receiving his kingdom, of course, there is still more. The spirit likewise must be sent forth upon the church and into the world, which occurs, uh, occurs at Pentecost. The fact that the spirit is poured forth into the world um, 
demonstrates that the church had entered into the last days of that age, as Joel had prophesied in Joel chapter 2, where when the Spirit is poured forth on all flesh, you enter into the last days, and the people who receive the Spirit would be able to prophesy about what God has done. And Peter speaks of this occurring in Acts chapter 2. But again, there's more. There's still more. The renewing and recreating work of the Spirit, taking what Christ has done and applying it to to those who believe, uh, begins at Pentecost. But it also, in order for the Pentecostal work to be completed, the old world has to crumble. The old age has to fall. The old wineskins have to be left by the wayside. The old world has to be destroyed in 70 AD. And this destruction of 70 AD demonstrates to us that Christ has actually become king and that the world which was enslaved to the devil altogether um, is now coming to a decisive and absolute end. So this, I believe, is the time, the duration which is coming to an end when the seventh trumpet blows. And then the mystery of God would be fulfilled. In Jesus, God is reclaiming the world from the powers of darkness. God is enthroning Christ and ushering in a new creation. One of the mysteries that are revealed in Jesus, as I said last week, is that the Gentiles are also now heirs of redemption. The way that Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise, uh, uh, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. One of the most unbelievable mysteries is that Gentiles are now part of the family of God. That was always God's plan, uh, as, as the New Testament makes quite clear. It was always God's intent to incorporate Gentiles into his people, um, and yet the people didn't quite understand. The Jews had, in many ways, forsaken their mission to be priests and kings. Uh, they are given exactly the same calling that the church was given, to be priests and kings in the world to be light unto the other nations so that the nations might be drawn to their light. And this is exactly the mission which Jesus gives to his church. Um, The physical Israel failed to do it because by disobedience and adultery, they actually abandon God, that they don't follow what God would have them do. And this mission along with this kingdom is then given to a church which is composed of both Jew and Gentile who are now united in one in the body of Christ Jesus. We've all been united in Christ himself. But likewise, there is another mystery that Paul also describes, which I think is, is useful because we see these various themes playing out in Revelation as well. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 4 through 7, it says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Right? This, this is another profound mystery, which is that because of what Christ has done, because, because of the work that the Holy Spirit has done in applying Jesus' work to us, we actually become united to Jesus. We become one flesh with Christ one body with one Lord, with indeed one husband of the church who loves the church as his bride. Jesus is judging his adulterous bride in Revelation. This is the the parable of the wedding feast, which is in Matthew 22, that, that, that those who were invited to the wedding, the king was throwing his son a wedding, and the people invited did not come but killed the servants, and therefore God destroys them and then invites everyone else to come to the wedding as well. As we proceed in Revelation, we're going to to see, we're going to witness actually the scene, which is the wedding feast of the Lamb after the adulterous city, the old Jerusalem, is destroyed. The old has to go before the new can come in. 
The martyrs are about to be vindicated. Their time of wait is about to be, is nearing its completion. And when the seventh trumpet blows, um, we will see the, this, this kind of complete sort of inauguration of, of this heavenly kingdom come to earth and the joining of Jew and Gentile into one bride. All of this is being fulfilled because the time is at hand, as the angel says. Now, the last few verses of chapter 10 rehearse again this uh, Ezekiel scene, as I'd referenced last week. Just as Ezekiel approaches God to receive an edible scroll, in the same way that Jesus, in the beginning of Revelation, approaches God in order to receive a sealed scroll, now, too, John must approach this angel who shines with the glorious face of God, the shining face of God, to, in order to receive a scroll. As I said thus far, John has been a seer. He has witnessed many visions um, when he is carried into the heaven, but John now is to become a prophet, to be commissioned to prophesy in a different kind of way. And in order to do this, he's given an edible word which he must consume. Um, I want to quote this from Peter Lightheart because I kind of loved it. He's referencing Thomas Aquinas, actually. But he says, as Thomas Aquinas said, spiritual food does not become the eater, but transforms the eater into itself. Having eaten the heavenly word as a gift from the angel of Jesus, John speaks the word because he becomes a word of the living word. If you notice the phrase that's used by the angel when he gives uh, the, the scroll to John, he says, take and eat it. Does that sound familiar to you? It should. Um, we haven't heard it in a while because of COVID, but it's almost identical to the Eucharistic phrasing that Jesus used when he instituted the Lord's Supper for the first time. Take this and eat, all of you, right? This is my body. This is a Eucharistic meal which John is being given so that he might become the man that God is calling him to be. Um, and this really is what also happens to us when we take communion. We participate in this same kind of a reality on Sunday mornings that, that we do, it is not merely a symbol. It is not an empty sign but as we confess, as the church has confessed, that there, this actually is a sacramental reality that the spirit, when we take communion, actually does spiritually give to us Jesus himself, his body and his blood. Not as if the bread is made into body or as the, the wine is turned into blood. It's, it's not that kind of a way, at least that's not the way that our, our denomination understands it. But Jesus is actually given to us in this way um, so that we might consume, so that we might eat the promise of the gospel. As the reformers were fond of saying, along with Augustine before them, communion is a visible word. It is the, the gospel made into bread and wine. It is uh, a real promise of salvation to everyone who eats of it in faith. It's, it's, it's tangible. It recognizes the way in which we're not just thinking things. We need something more physical, more tangible, tactile even, um, because that God knows that we're dust. He knows who we are. And so God does not uh, despise who we are, but rather, Rather, God approaches us in ways that, that translate um, these realities to us in a way that wouldn't be otherwise. And he does throw through bread and through wine and, and through water, these common things which in the economy of God by the power of the Spirit actually does something tangible in us. It transforms us. Um, you know, this communion, it, it's a promise that Christ has broken his body and shed his blood, not for some indeterminate kind of us or, or some, some them out there. But when you hear those words, when you take communion, and I hope you remember this next time, when you hear those words, this is my body broken for you, I want you to understand that that's God throwing his voice He's speaking through the mouth of Rob or whoever your pastor is, if you're not from Coral Ridge. That is God throwing his voice, speaking to you, 
saying that this is indeed Jesus' body, Jesus giving himself unto you. It is true that you individually have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. And that we know is true as we receive it in faith. It's for you personally, even as it is for us together as one body. Those who eat the body and blood of Christ become, as he is, sacrificial servants of God and priests and kings. Right? We become prophets then who proclaim the word of Christ, which the Spirit then uses to create faith in the hearts of those who are fallen, so that they too might be redeemed. When God gives us these gifts, as he gives John this word here, this book to eat, as he gives us bread and wine, it is in order that he might make us to be like his son and it assists in that movement. The 144,000 martyrs are said to follow Jesus wherever he goes, and that's because they have become like Jesus. By faith, they were united with him, and through the sacramental eating of his gifts of bread and wine, his body and blood, they too become those who will likewise pour their blood out upon the earth. But alongside this, we recognize with, even as John experienced, that these things are both sweet and bitter for us. The secrets which are now given to John are sweet, but they are desperately bitter because these are words of judgment and of woe. And in, in the same way, I think, you know, this thinking of communion, it reminds me of that George Herbert poem, The Agony, where it says, Love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. I love that. Um, the sacrificial gift of Christ is sweet, right? It is nothing less than redemption, resurrection from the dead, uh, recreation into his image, but it is given through his blood, through his very death. It is sweet, but it is bitter. Becoming like Christ is sweet, and yet to become like Christ is to be rejected, to be hated, to be persecuted, uh, even to be killed, um, as certainly this was the case in this first century, as Revelation describes, and it's been true around the world ever since as well. You know, we're very, very lucky to be in a nation where we really, I mean, it is absent of persecution, what we could legitimately call persecution in the way that is experienced throughout the world. Um, Considering this, I think we must ask ourselves, how are we using the freedom that we have um, for the sake of the gospel? You know, the, I, I was in India. Rebecca and I went to India and uh, for uh, um, Anisha. She was a, an intern here. We went there for her wedding. Some of you may know her. And um, Prime Minister Modi of, of India is uh, very much um, a radical Hindu nationalist. He wants India to become a Hindu-only nation if he can do his best. And what they have witnessed there has been an... an uh, unbelievable increase in persecution of religious minorities, uh, and in the first case to Muslims, but it's turning also to Christians as well. Um, Christians just represent a smaller segment of the population. And just being among them, you know, and, and realizing, talking with them about their fears, um, they're real. I mean, at any moment, at any moment, someone could come into that church and could, they could either be killed, they could be taken, thrown in prison, and at any moment, I mean, you would just have, you have roving bands of, of radical Hindus who are just killing Christians and killing Muslims. Um, you know, and it's, it's fascinating the way that while speaking to their pastor, what he said his goal was. He said that my goal above all else is that if at any moment they come in and they shut down this church or if they come in and they kill me, that every single member of my church would be able, would be so equipped, would be so knowledgeable of the scripture and how, what it means and how to teach it, that every single individual of my church could start their own home church immediately that day. I think that's such an amazing thing, right? I mean, he's the persecution which they experience are driving them, but it makes me ask, what are we doing in the midst of our lack of persecution, in the midst of our unbelievable freedoms? I think Revelation confronts us in the same way that it ought to confront the churches whom Jesus spoke to, where he warned them that they must repent because in, they, instead of faithfully following him, they were compromising by by 
moving into the, the culture, by living exactly like the culture, by sharing the same values of their culture, by engaging even in the idolatrous practices of their culture. And it makes me wonder, right? I mean, are we giving ourselves over to those values as well? It's, we must ask ourselves these questions because it's very difficult for us to identify these things if we are not very, very sharp about it. We need to be pointed with ourselves, thoroughly inquiring of our own hearts because if we don't, we're just not gonna notice because we're, we're fish in water, right? I mean, we're like, in so many ways we can be, you know, you've heard that example a million times of if you put like a toad in, in the water and you heat it up very slowly, he's never gonna notice it and he's gonna die when it boils. That is so often what we are like in the midst of culture um, because we are just, we're just in it without even realizing it. And I ask, you know, are we giving ourselves to materialism to individualism, to a kind of political nationalism that is not becoming, that is not of God. You know, like the church of Revelation needed to be cleansed. We, every single day, every week, every month, we need to ask ourselves and look in these things um, so that we would not uh, turn. I think it's especially true. I'm going on a bit of a tangent. I think it's especially true um, in, in such a politically charged environment, an environment where in the midst of this crazy COVID, in the midst of, of just the abject, um, just almost, I mean, not quite destruction of our economy, but certainly a substantial dip in the midst of the hostility and the hatred. I mean, we need to ask ourselves, are we, bec are we as individual followers of Christ part of the solution or are we still just being part of the problem? You know, I think it's so easy for us um, to to buy into the narratives of the world, to, to just adopt the attitudes of those around us, you know, and especially in a political environment like ours. I mean, there are, I'm, I'm speaking of friends of mine, you know, I mean, there are people who really believe that they're the only hope we have for a future is if one of a Republican or a Democrat wins, depending upon their politics, that it's the only hope. Yet apart from that, everything is lost. Everything is over. And are we also buying into these lies, right? That God's, because again, what are we defined by? Who, where is our identity? Where is our citizenship? What is the, the overarching reality in our life that makes everything else relative? It's the kingdom of almighty God. The fact that you and I are kings and priests of a kingdom that is not of this world, but which is coming to it, which should hopefully free us. It should free us so that we would not engage in the world the way that the world does, that we would be able to look fundamentally different because we should. We should look fundamentally different from this world, not engaging in the hatred and the hostility but following Christ, being those who love those who hate them, who pray for purported enemies, right? Who become servants of all. That it is not, our goal is not to become the first, the highest, the mightiest, but that actually following Christ, that in order to become first, we must first become last. We must become the servant of all people. And I think in such charged times, you know, the only hope that we have to engage well in our culture is to remember that we're actually foreigners in a fallen world, where we are uh, ambassadors of uh, bringing a message of a king, of a king outside of this world. Um, and Christ's kingdom and his kingdom alone is the, the only thing which is going to last. Every other thing is going to fade. Every other thing is going to fade. Um, and so let us set our eyes on heavenly things. Let us Seek always to become continually more like Jesus. Okay, I'm sorry, enough of that uh, tangent. Again, we become like what we consume. We must, of course, consider what it is we are consuming. But when God gives us heavenly food, it's for transformation, as John himself experienced, being transformed from a seer now to a prophet. As Romans 8, 17, we share in his sufferings in order that we share in his glory because we are united with Christ, all of his experiences will naturally become ours. And hopefully, right, the goal, the, the destiny which each of us have is to become so like Jesus that we would be conformed perfectly to his image. 
I mean, just imagine what your life would look like if people mistook you for Jesus all the time. You know, I mean, could you imagine that? Like, oh, I thought you were Jesus. It's you, David, right? I mean, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's, that is the hope above all else, that as we seek to follow Christ, as we engage in his word, as we s- experience the renewing of our minds, as we conform everything we think, we believe, and we feel to the scriptures, that we would be as Jesus is. All right. Um, One final thing, and then we'll end for today. The last verse of Revelation 10 um, says, and I was told, um, that's how it's translated most of the time. Um, After John consumes it, he hears many voices speak. Actually, it should say, and they said to me, um, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Who are they? It is the spirit as an angel. It is the voice of heaven from heaven, which directs John to go and to take the scroll. It is the thunderous voices, the seven thunders that echo each time the angel speaks. John is given this. uh, It's actually a Trinitarian commission, which Jesus himself also experienced. Just as Jesus was commissioned by God, when God speaks as a thunderous voice from heaven, as the spirit descends upon him, so too is John now commissioned as a prophet by the spirit, coming to him as an angel, with the father speaking as a voice from heaven, and by the thunderous voices that echo, which sound much like Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, whose voice also thunders like the rush of many waters. These three together, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, command John to prophesy, and indeed he will. Okay, um, that is the end for today. Um, I need to spend a lot more time with uh, Revelation, uh, what is it, 12 um, this week? I'm sorry, Revelation 11 this week. Um, there's a lot in there, and so I, uh, I know I need to spend some more time with it. So I'm excited for that, uh, and I pray that you guys are blessed this week. Um, let's pray as we end our time. Lord Jesus, I pray above all else that you would continue to make us to be your holy people, that we would truly reflect you in ways that go beyond our capacity to even understand, that you would renovate every single area of all of our lives, that you would become Lord functionally of every single area of our lives, individually, as families, as couples, as a church. That's the goal. That's the goal. And we, we will not be able to do it apart from your grace. We cannot do anything apart from your grace. So God, this week, I pray that you would convict us all according to our sin. I pray that you would renew our minds, that we might see things we have not understood before that we might understand who we are, that we might understand what your purpose is for each of us individually, that you would give us opportunities that we might proclaim the gospel to those around us, and that, God, you would cause us to abound as the most loving people in a hateful world, in a divided and vicious world, uh, that the nations rage, God, But as we remember and recognize you're sovereign, you're above all things, you work all things out for the good of those who love you, that God, that that would give us comfort so that we would be freed from the hostilities that surround us, that we would show the world, as you said that we would, that we are your disciples by the way that we love. So God, would you keep doing this in us? We need you. We need you. We need you, Lord. And we pray this in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen.